The following is from A.W. Pink's Exposition of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7, 1. Judge not, that you be not judged. The title is called Unlawful Judgment. The verses at which we have now arrived begin a new section of our Lord's Sermon. And that it is by no means one of the simplest appears from the diverse treatment which it is received at the hands of the commentators. They are almost unanimous in allowing that our Lord's prohibition, judge not, cannot be understood in its widest possible latitude. Yet as to how far and wherein it is to be modified, there is little agreement. That Christ forbidding us to exercise and pass judgment upon others cannot be taken absolutely. Few, if any, who are acquainted with the general tenor of God's word would deny, yet as soon as they attempted to define its limitations, a considerable variety of opinions would be expressed. This should at once warn us against coming to any hasty conclusion as to the meaning of Matthew 7.1, and guard us against being misled by the mere sound of its words. Yea, it should drive us to our knees, begging God graciously to subdue the prejudices of our hearts and enlighten our minds, and then diligently search the scriptures for other passages which throw light upon the one now before us. Not only is it very necessary for our own personal good that we spare no pains in endeavoring to arrive at a right understanding of these verses, for it is to our own loss that we misapprehend any portion of Holy Writ, as it will be to our own condemnation if we transgress this divine commandment. But unless its meaning be open to us, we shall be at a loss to repel those who would bring us into bondage by the corrupt use they make of it. There are few verses quoted more frequently than the opening one of Matthew 7, and few less understood by those who are so ready to cite it and hurl it at the heads of those whom they ignorantly or maliciously suppose are contravening it. Let the servant of God denounce a man who is promulgating serious error, And there are those boasting of their broad-mindedness who will say to him, Judge not that you be not judged. Let the saint faithfully rebuke an offender for some sin, and he is likely to have the same text quoted against him. Judge not that you be not judged. The word which is here rendered judge is one that occurs frequently in the New Testament, and it is used in quite a variety of senses. It is the one found in, I speak as to wise men, judge ye what I say, 1 Corinthians 10.15, and in judging yourselves as a comely that a woman pray unto God uncovered, 1 Corinthians 11.13, where judge means weigh carefully and form an opinion or consideration. It occurs in, Thou Simon, whom Christ asks, which of them will love him most, has rightly judged, Luke 7.43, where it signifies, inferred, or drawn, a conclusion. It occurs in, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, Acts 16.15, that is, if you regard or account me so. Take ye him and judge him according to your law, John 18.31, means put him on trial before your court. In Romans 14.3, judge has a force of despise, as is clear from the first member of the antithesis. Does our law judge any man before it hear him? John 51, where judge signifies condemn, its commonest signification. Which or how many of these meanings the word judge has in our text must be carefully ascertained and not hastily or arbitrarily assumed. Now the first thing to do when prayerfully studying a passage on which opinions vary is to examine its context. First, the remote and then the immediate. In this instance, the remote would be the particular portion of the word in which it occurs, namely the Sermon on the Mount. As we pass from one section to another in this sermon, it is very important that we bear in mind our Lord's dominant object and design therein, which was to show that he requires in the character and conduct of his disciples something radically different from and far superior to that religion which obtained among the Jews, the highest form of which they regarded, the scribes and Pharisees as possessing. The keynote was struck by Christ when he told his hearers, Except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Verse 20. That which proceeds and all that follows to the end of his discourse is to be pondered and interpreted in the light of that statement. In the earlier chapters, we called attention frequently to what has last been pointed out, and it must not be lost sight of as we enter upon the present division of our Lord's address. 
That which preeminently characterized the Pharisees was the very high regard which they had for themselves, and the utter contempt in which they held all who belonged not to their sect. This is evident from the words of Christ in Luke 18.9, where we are told, He spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. And what immediately follows, we have contrasted the Pharisee and the publican. The Pharisees took it upon them to go up and down, passing censorious and unjust judgment upon others, while blind to their own glaring faults. The disciple of Christ is to conduct himself in a manner exactly the reverse, unsparingly judging himself and refusing to invade the office of God where others are concerned. The more immediate context of Matthew 7 verse 1 is the verses which follow it. In order to obtain a right understanding of verse 1, it is important to recognize that the next four verses are inseparably connected with it, that the five together form one complete section treating of the same subject. The contents of verse 2 show plainly that we have a continuation of the theme of verse 1, while the and at the beginning of verse 3 and the or at the beginning of verse 4 denote the same thing, while verse 5 contains our Lord's application of the whole. The value of preserving the link between the later verses and the opening one lies in noting the threefold mention of thy brother in verses 3, 4, and 5, and in observing what is there said of his state and the state of the one who takes him to task. If these details be kept in mind, we shall be preserved from making an erroneous interpretation and application of verse 1. As we must not too much anticipate what is to come, we will leave these suggestions with the reader for him to ponder. After carefully weighing both the remote and immediate contexts of our verse, our next task is to search the scriptures for all other passages treating of, or bearing upon the subject of judging others. It is most essential that we do so if we are to be preserved from many erroneous ideas. Some statements of Holy Writ are presented in a very terse and contracted form, but elsewhere they are amplified and filled out. Others are expressed in seemingly absolute terms, but elsewhere are modified and qualified. As an illustration of the latter, take the fourth commandment. The Sabbath day is to be kept holy, in it thou shalt not do any work. Yet from the teachings of Christ we know that works of piety, of mercy, and of necessity are lawful on that day. So it is with our present text. Unless we are very careful in our interpretation of it, we shall prohibit what is elsewhere required, and be found censoring that which other passages commend. The capacity of judging, of forming an estimate and opinion, is one of our most valuable faculties, and to right use of it, one of the most important duties. Why, even of yourselves, judge ye not what is right? Luke 12.57, says our Lord. Judge righteous judgment, John 7.24. If we do not form judgments as to what is true and false, how can we embrace the one and avoid the other? John Brown. It is very necessary that we have our senses exercised to discern, and the Greek thoroughly judge, both good and evil, Hebrews 5.14. If we are not to be deceived by appearances and taken in by every oily-mouthed imposter we encounter, it must not be thought that our Lord here forbade us to act according to the dictates of common prudence, and to form an estimate of everything we meet with in the path of duty, nor even that he prohibited us from judging men's characters and actions, according to their avowed principles and visible conduct. For in this very chapter he bids us measure men by this rule, saying, By their fruits he shall know them, verse 20. And many duties to others absolutely require us to form a judgment of men, with respect both to their state and their conduct. Unless we form estimates and come to a decision of what is good and evil in those we meet with, we shall be found rejecting the one and condoning the other. But where are false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravening wolves? Matthew 7.15 How shall we heed this injunction unless we carefully measure every preacher we hear by the word of God? Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them, Ephesians 5.11. In order to obey this, we are obliged to exercise a judgment as to what are works of darkness. We command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, 2 Thessalonians 3.6. This compels us to decide who is walking disorderly. 
Mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. Romans 16, verse 17. This requires us to determine who are guilty of such things. Thus, it is abundantly clear that our Lord's prohibition in Matthew 7, 1 is by no means to be taken absolutely. There are four kinds of judging which are lawful and required by the word, two public and two private. First, ecclesiastical judgment. This belongs chiefly to the minister, who in preaching God's word judges men by admonishing their sins. And in his private dealings he must be faithful to their souls and rebuke where necessary. The judgment of the church is exercised when it decides upon the credibility of the profession of one applying for membership, so too in the maintenance of discipline and exclusion of those who refuse to heed its reproofs. Second, civil government. This pertains to the magistrate, whose office it is to examine those charged with criminal offenses, giving judgment according to the laws of the land, acquitting the innocent, sentencing those proved guilty. Legitimate private judgment is first, where one man in a Christian manner reprehends another for his sins, which is required by the Lord, Leviticus 19, verse 17, and second, where the gross or faults of notorious offenders are condemned, and others informed thereof that they be warned against them. Judge not. That which is here forbidden is unlawful judging of our fellows, of which we will instance a variety of cases. First, officiously or magisterially, which lies outside the prerogative of the private individual. This is assuming such an authority over others as we would not allow them to exercise over us since our role is to be subject one to another and be clothed with humility, 1 Peter 5, verse 5. We are required both by the law of nature, which includes rationality and prudence, and the scriptures to judge of things and persons too, as we meet them in the sphere of duty, but to judge whatever lies outside of our path and province is forbidden. Study to be quiet and do your own business, for Thessalonians 4.11, If we give full and proper heed to this divine precept, we shall have little or no leisure left to pry into the affairs of others. That which our text prohibits is a passing beyond our legitimate sphere, that taken upon us to judge that which is not set before us for judgment, intruding into the circle of others, let none of you suffer, and so on, as a busybody in other men's matters. 1 Peter 4, verse 15. Second, judge not presumptuously, which is done when we treat mere suspicions or unconfirmed rumors as though they were authenticated facts, and when we ascribe actions to springs which lie outside the range of our cognizance, to pass judgment on the motives of another, which are open to none save the eyes of omniscience, is highly reprehensible, for it is an intrusion upon the divine prerogative and invading of the very office of God. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Romans 14.4 Places a divine ban upon such conduct. A notable example of what is here interdicted is recorded in Job 1. When the Lord commended his servant to Satan, saying, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth? A perfect and an upright man, one that fears God and eschews evil. The evil one answered, Does Job fear God for naught? Has not thou made an hedge about him and about his house and about all that he has on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now and touch all that he has, and he will curse thee to thy face. Verses 8 and 11. Suggesting that Job only served God for the gain of it. Thus to judge presumptuously the motives of another is devilish. Third, judge not hypocritically. This form of unlawful judgment was particularly before our Lord on this occasion, as appears from the verses which immediately follow. The one who is quick to detect the minor faults of others while blind to or unconcerned about his own graver sins is dishonest, pretending to be very precise while giving free rein to his own lusts. Such two-facedness is most reprehensible in the sight of God and to all right-minded people, too. Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judges. For when thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doeth the same things. Romans 2, verse 1. 
no matter what may be his social standing, his educational advantages, his religious profession, the one who is guilty of partiality, who censors in others that which he allows in himself, is inexcusable and self-condemned. That even true, yea, eminent saints are liable to this grievous sin, appear from the case of David. For when Nathan propounded the instance of the rich man sparing his own flock and sheath in the one lamb of his poor neighbors, David's anger was greatly kindled, and he had judged the transgressor as worthy of death, while lying himself under guilt equally heinous. Second Samuel chapter 12, verses 1 to 11. Fourth, judge not hastily or rashly. Before thinking the worst of any person, we must make full investigation and obtain clear proof that our suspicions are well grounded or the report we heard is a reliable one. Before the Most High brought upon the world a confusion of languages, it is said that he came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded, Genesis 11.5, as though he would personally investigate their conduct before he passed sentence upon them. So again, before he destroyed the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, he said, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which has come unto me, Genesis 18.21. Thus God would teach us that before we pass sentence in our minds upon any offender, we must take the trouble of obtaining decisive proof of his guilt. We are expressly commanded, Judge not according to the appearance, John 7, verse 24, for appearances are proverbially deceptive. Always go to the transgressor and give him an opportunity to clear himself. He that answers a manner before he hears it, it is folly and shame to him, Proverbs 18, 13. Fifth, judge not unwarrantably, which is to go beyond the rule which is set before us. In God's word, certain things are commended, certain things condemned. Yet there is another class of things on which the scriptures pronounce no verdict, which we term things indifferent, and to condemn anyone for using such things is to be righteous over much. Ecclesiastes 7.16 It was for just such offenses that the apostle reproved some of the saints at Rome, who were sitting in judgment upon their brethren over different things as meat and drink. So too he admonished the Colossians who were being brought into bondage by the touch not, taste not, handle not of the commandments and doctrines of men. The Holy Spirit points out that in such cases to judge a brother is to speak evil of the law, James 4.11, which means that he who condemns a brother for anything which God has not proscribed regards the law as being faulty because it has not prohibited such things. He who quarrels with his brother and condemns him for the sake of anything not determined in the word of God, does thereby reflect on his word as if it were not a perfect rule, in quote Matthew Henry. 6. Judge not unjustly or unfairly, ignoring everything that is favorable in another and fixing only on that which is unfavorable. It is often far from being an easy matter to secure all the materials and facts which in any case are necessary to form a judgment. Yet to pronounce judgment without them is to run a serious hazard of doing another a cruel injustice. Many a one has rashly condemned another one who, had he known all, might have approved or at least pitied him. Again, it is very unjust to censor one who has sincerely done his best, simply because his effort falls short of what satisfies us. Much unjust judgment proceeds from a spirit of revenge and a desire to do mischief. When David sent his servants to comfort Hanan, the king of Ammon, upon the death of his father, that king suffered his nobles to persuade him that the servants of David were spies on an evil mission, Second Samuel 10. A horrible war was the outcome. Behold how great a fire a little manner kindleth. Seventh, judge not unmercifully. Well, on one hand we are certainly not, as far too many today appear to think, obliged to regard one who holds fundamental error or one who is thoroughly worldly as a good Christian. Yet on the other hand, a law of charity requires us to put the best construction we can on doubtful actions and never without proof ascribe good ones to evil principles or motives. God does not require us to call darkness light or evil good. Nevertheless, since we are so full of sin ourselves and so prone to err, we must ever be on our guard lest we call light darkness and good evil. We are not to go about with our eyes closed, nor wink at sin when we see it. Yet it is equally wrong for us to hunt for something to condemn, and seize upon every trifle and magnify molehills into mountains. 
We are not to make a man an offender for a word, nor harbor suspicions where there is no evidence. Many a one has condemned another where no ground for judgment existed, out of personal jealousy and ill will, which is doing Satan's work. May the Lord graciously deliver both writer and reader from all these forms of unlawfully judging others. This has been a reading of an exposition of the Sermon on the Mount by A.W. Pink. We're going to continue this audio recording by reading from John Owen's exposition of Hebrews 3.12, how the heart is gradually brought under denomination by the power and efficacy of unbelief, and that with special respect to that particular sin of departing from the living God, and this is done several ways. First, unbelief sets all the corrupt lusts and affections of the heart at liberty to act according to their own perverse nature and inclination. The heart of man is by nature evil. All the thoughts and imaginations of it are only evil continually, Genesis 6, 5. It is full of all corrupt affections, which act themselves and influence men in all they do. The gospel comes in a direct opposition to these lusts and corrupt affections, both in the root and in the fruit of them. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to us, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we shall live soberly, righteous, and godly in this present world, Titus 2, 11 and 12. There is no greater duty that it charges our souls with than the mortification, crucifying, and destruction of them, and this indispensably if we intend to be made partakers of the promises of it, Colossians 3, 5, and 8, Romans 8, 13. Moreover, it is the first proper work of that faith in which we believe the gospel in and upon our own souls to cleanse them from these lusts and affections. It is a work of faith to purify the heart being the great means or instrument in which God is pleased to effect it, purifying our hearts by faith, Acts 15.9. For receiving the promises, it teaches, persuades, and enables us to cleanse ourselves from all uncleanness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God, 2 Corinthians 7, verse 1. Now these two, faith and the gospel, make up our profession, the one being that in which or whereby we profess, the other that which we do profess. And they both concur in this design, namely the purifying of the heart. So far as these prevail upon us or in us, that work is successful. And where there is no weakening of the lusts of the heart, no restraint laid upon them, no resistance made to them, there is no profession at all. There is nothing of faith or gospel that takes place. For they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. Galatians 5.24 They have done so actually in some measure or degree. All then who have taken upon them the profession of the gospel in reality, although it be only on account of light and conviction, have restrained and have curbed them, and taken upon themselves a law of resistance to them. Hence all of them proceed so far at least as to escape the pollutions of the world, through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, 2 Peter 2.20. Those who attain not this far are in no sense to be esteemed such as profess the gospel. But now whenever unbelief begins to influence the heart towards the frame described, it sets in the first place these corrupt lusts and affections at liberty to act themselves according to their own nature, and this it does two ways. First, with respect to the gospel and its efficacy for the mortification of them. For it takes off, weakens, and disarms those considerations which the gospel tenders to the souls of men for that end. The way and means in which the gospel of itself works towards the mortification of the lusts of the heart is by the proposition of its promises and threatenings to the minds of men. These work morally upon them, for the consideration of them causes men to set themselves against all those things which may cause them to come short of the one, or make them obnoxious to the other, Second Corinthians 7, verse 1. Now all influence upon the soul to this end from hence is intercepted by unbelief. Its proper nature and work lies in beginning a disregard of gospel promises and threatenings through a diffidence of them. And hereof we have examples every day. Men are in a constant way worked upon by the preaching of the word. That is, their minds are influenced by a taste of the good things proposed and promised in it and are brought under a sense of the terror of the Lord and its threatenings. The first proper effect of this in themselves is the resistance of their lusts, 
and the reformation of their lives thereon. But we see that many of these, losing through unbelief a sense of that impression that was on them from the word, have all their lusts let loose unto rage and violence, and so return again like the dog to his vomit, and the sow that was washed who were wallowing in the mire, Second Peter 2, verse 22. Secondly, with respect unto faith itself, this is evident from the nature of the thing. For where unbelief thrives or grows, their faith must decay and wax weak. But especially it impedes and hinders faith in the work before described, by the private of the means and instruments in which it works, which are care, watchfulness, or vigilancy against sin. For its great design lies in making the soul negligent, careless, and slothful in the opposition of sin. Where this is attained, the whole work of faith is defeated, and lust is set at liberty. And where this is so, it immediately returns to act according to its own corrupt and perverse nature, which, as we have elsewhere at large declared, is enmity against God. And this consists both in an aversion from God and an opposition to Him. Look, then, whatever approaches a man in his profession has made towards God, the work of these lusts and corruptions, now at liberty, is to incline him to withdraw and depart from them. This renders the heart evil and disposes it to an utter departure from the living God. Secondly, it renders the heart evil by debasing it and casting all good, honest, ingenuous, and noble principles out of it. The gospel furnishes the mind of man with the best and highest principles towards God and man that is in this world. It is receptive of. This might easily be evinced against all the false and foolish pretenses of the old philosophy or present atheism of the world. Whatever there is of faith, love, submission, or conformity to God that may engenerate a return into that image and likeness of him which we fell from by sin and apostasy, Whatever is of innocency, righteousness, truth, patience, forbearance, that may render us fruitful and useful in or needful to the community of mankind. Whatever is pure, lovely, peaceable, praiseworthy in a man's own soul, and the retirements of his mind is all proposed, taught, and exhibited by the word of the gospel. Now principles of this nature do lively ennoble the soul and render it good and honorable. But the work of unbelief is to cast them all out, at least as to their special nature communicated to them by the gospel, which alone brings with it an impress of the image and likeness of God. And when this is separated from any of the things before mentioned, they are of no value. This then renders the heart base and evil and gives it an utter dislike of communion or intercourse with God. Thirdly, it accumulates a heart with a dreadful guilt of ingratitude against God, which before profession it was incapable of. When a person has been brought to the knowledge of the gospel and by it vindicated out of darkness and delivered from the sensuality of the world, and has also, it may be, tasted of the good word of God and of the powers of the world to come, for such a one to draw back, to forsake the Lord in his ways, through the power of unbelief, there is a great aggravation attending a sin, 2 Peter 2, verse 20 and 21. And when once the heart is deflowered by this horrible sin of ingratitude, It will prostitute itself of its own accord to all manner of abominations. And for us, it is good to have the spring of all our danger in the course of our profession continually in our eye. Here it lies, the root of it is here laid open, and if it be not continually washed against, all our other endeavors to persevere blameless to the end are and will be in vain. Number two. The next thing in the words is that special evil which the apostle cautions the Hebrews against, and that which is a heart made evil by the prevalency of unbelief, would tend to, which is like to ensue if not prevented in the causes of it, and that is departing from the living God. It may be that these Hebrews thought nothing less than that their departure from the profession of the gospel was a departure from the living God. Probably they rather pretended and pleaded that they were returning to him, for they did not fall off to idols or idolatry, but returned to observe, as they thought, the institutions of the living God, and for a relinquishment whereof the blaspheming and persecuting part of them traduced our apostle himself as an apostate, Acts 21:28, To obviate this apprehension in them, and that they might not thereby countenance themselves in their defection, which men are apt to do with various pretenses, 
The apostle lets him know that after the revelation of Christ and profession of him, there is no departure from him and his institutions, but that men do withal depart from the living God. So John positively declares on the one hand and the other, second epistle, verse 9, Whosoever transgresses and abides not in the doctrine of Christ has not God. He that abides in the doctrine of Christ, he has both the Father and the Son. In a recession from the gospel or doctrine of Christ, God himself is forsaken. He that has not the Son, he is not the Father. As on the other side, continuance in the doctrine of the gospel secures us an interest not in the Son only, but in the Father also. He then that rejects Christ in the gospel, let him pretend what he will of adhering to God. He has forsaken the living God, and cleaves to an idol of his own heart. For neither is a father without the Son, nor is he a God unto us, but in and by him. Secondly, it may be he would mind them of the person and nature of him from whom he would prevent their departure, namely, that however in respect of his office, and as he was incarnate, he was our mediator, our apostle and high priest, yet in his own divine person he was one with his Father and the Blessed Spirit, the living God. Thirdly, which either alone or in concurrence with these other reasons is certainly in the word, that he might deter them from the sin he cautions them against by the pernicious event and consequent of it. And this is, that therein they would depart from him who is a great, terrible, and dreadful God, the living God, who is able to punish and avenge their sin, and that to all eternity. And this appears to be in the words, and that he again insists on the same argument afterwards, for to the same purpose he tells them that it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, chapter 10, verse 31. And as this property of life, as it is in God essentially and causally, whence he is called the living God, is exceedingly and eminently accommodated to encourage us to faith, trust, confidence, and affiance in him, in all straits and difficulties, while we are in the way of our duty, as our apostle declares, 1 Timothy 4:10. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God. Or this is that which encourages us to and supports us in all our laborings and sufferings, namely because he whom we trust in, whom we expect assistance from here, and a reward hereafter, is the living God. So it is that which deservedly casts the greatest awe and terror upon the minds of men and their sins and rebellion against him. For as this life of God includes in it the notion and consideration of all those properties which hold out encouragements to us and things present and to come, so it is also that of those dreadful attributes of his power, holiness, and eternity, which sinners have reason to bethink themselves of in their provocations of him. So he frequently prefaces expressions of his severity against stubborn sinners. I live, saith the Lord, as it were, bidding of them to consider what thence they were to expect. And this seems to me the principal reason why the apostle thus states the sin of their apostasy, that it is a departure from the living God. Observation. The malignity and venom of sin is apt to hide itself under many, under any shades and pretenses. I don't speak of the evasions and pretexts in which men endeavor to cover or countenance themselves and their miscarriages in the world, and to others, but of those pleas and pretenses which they will admit of in their minds, partly to induce their wills and affections to sin, and partly to relieve and countenance their consciences under sin. Amongst those reasonings which these Hebrews had in themselves about a relinquishment of the gospel and its institutions, they never considered it as an apostasy from the living God. They looked upon it as a peculiar way of worship, attended with difficulties and persecutions which perhaps they might please God as well in the omission of. By this means did they hide from themselves that mortal malignity and poison that was in their sin. And so it is in every sin. The subtlety and deceit of lusts still strives to conceal the true and proper nature of sin in which it entices or is enticed. When Naaman the Syrian would notwithstanding his conviction abide in his idol worship, because of his secular advantage it is but a going with his master into the house of Ramon, and bowing there, not that he intended to have any other god but the god of Israel, 2 Kings 5.18. So long ago had he practically learned that principle which men had not until of late the impudence doctrinally to advance in the world, namely that an arbitrary rectifying of men's intentions alters the nature of their moral and spiritual actions. So they say that if one man kill another, not with an intention to kill him, 
but to vindicate his own honor by his so doing, it is no sin, or at least no great sin, or much to be regarded. And what is this but directly to comply with the deceitfulness of sin which we have laid down? For none sure is so flagitiously wicked as to make the formal nature of sin their object and end, nor it may be is human nature capable of such an excess and exorbitancy from itself and its concreated principles. But still some other end is proposed by a corrupt design and incitation of the mind, which is a blind unto its wickedness. But of this deceit of sin I have treated at large in another discourse. Observation 6. The best way to antidote the soul against sin is to represent it to the mind in its true nature and tendency. The hiding of these was a way and means in which sin first entered into the world. By this Satan drew our first parents into their transgression. Hiding from them the nature and end of their sin, he ensnared and seduced them. In the same way and method does he still proceed. This caused our apostle here to rend off the covering and vain pretenses which the Hebrews were ready to put upon their relinquishment of the gospel. He presents it here naked to them as a fatal defection and apostasy from the living God. And in this gives them also to understand its end, which was no other but the casting of themselves into his revenging hand to eternity. So dealt Samuel with Saul in the manner of Amalek. Saul pretended that he had only brought fat cattle for sacrifice, but Samuel lets him know that there was rebellion in his disobedience, abhorred of God like the sin of witchcraft. Indeed, if not all, yet the principal efficacy of temptation consists in hiding the nature and tendency of sin, while the mind is exercised with it, and therefore the discovery and due consideration of them must needs be an effectual means to counterwork it and to obviate its prevalency. And this is the principal design of the scripture and all that it treats about sin. It establishes a command against it by showing what it is, the iniquity, folly, and perversity of it, as also what is its end, or what in the righteousness of God it will bring the sinner to. So the great contest that is in the mind, when it is hurried up and down with any temptation, is whether it shall fix itself on these right considerations of sin, or allow itself at the present to be carried away with the vain pleas of its temptation and its attempt to palliate and cover it. And on this contest depends the final issue of the matter. If the mind keep up itself to the true notion of the nature and end of sin, through the strength of grace, its temptation will probably be evaded and disappointed. So it was with Joseph. Various suggestions he had made to him, but he keeps his mind fixed on that. How can I do this great wickedness and sin against God, which preserved him and delivered him, Genesis 39, 9. But if the mind be prevailed with to admit of those representations of sin which are made to it in its temptations, sin and the perpetration of it will ensue. And this is the principal part of our wisdom about sin and temptations, namely that we always keep our minds possessed with that notion and sense of the nature and end of sin which God in his word represents to us with a complete watchfulness against that which the deceit of lust and the craft of Satan would suggest. Observation 7. Whoever departs from the observation of the gospel and the institutions of it does in so doing depart from the living God, or an apostate from the gospel is an absolute apostate from God. This the apostle expressly teaches the Hebrews in this place. Men think it almost a matter of nothing to play with gospel institutions at their pleasure. They can observe them or omit them as seems good to themselves. Nay, some suppose they may utterly relinquish any regard to them without the least forfeiture of the favor of God, but this will appear to be otherwise. For first, in their so doing, the authority of God over their souls and consciences is utterly rejected, and so consequently is God himself. For where his authority is not owned, his being is despised. Now there are various ways in which God puts forth and manifests his authority over men. He does it in and by his works, his law, by the consciences or inbred notions of the minds of men. Every way in which he reveals himself, he also makes known his sovereign authority over us. For sovereign power or authority is the very first notion that a creature can have of its creator. Now all these ways of revealing the authority of God are recapitulated in the gospel. God having brought all things to a head in Christ Jesus, Ephesians 1.10. 
All power in heaven and in earth, that is, as to the actual administration of it, is given into his hand, Matthew 28:18, and he is given or appointed to be head over all things, Ephesians 1, 20-22. As we have at large declared on the third verse of the first chapter, God therefore does not put forth or exercise the least of his power, but in and by Christ. For the Father judges no man, but has committed all judgment to the Son, John 5:22. Now the Lord Christ exercises his power and authority principally by the gospel, which is the rod of his power, Psalm 110, verse 2. Hereunto then are reduced all other ways whatever in which the authority of God is exerted over the souls and consciences of men. And if this be rejected, the whole authority of God is utterly cast off. This, therefore, is done by all who reject, relinquish, or despise the gospel. They forsake God himself, the living God, and that absolutely and utterly. God is not owned where his monarchy is not owned. Let men deal so with their rulers and try how it will be interpreted. Let them pretend they acknowledge them, but reject the only way, all the ways they have, for the exercise of their authority, and it will doubtless be esteemed a revolt from them. Secondly, there is no other way or means in which men may yield any obedience or worship to God but only by the gospel. And so no other way in which men may express their subjection to him or dependence upon him, and where this is not done, he is necessarily forsaken. Whatever men say or do or pretend as to the worship of God, if it be not in and by the name of Christ, if it be not appointed and revealed in the gospel, it is not performed to the living God, but to an idol of their own hearts. For the only true God is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and therefore by what act or act soever men may design to give honor to God and to own their dependence on him, if it be not done in Christ according to the gospel, it is all an abomination to him. He says of all such worship as he did of the sacrifices of the Israelites when their hearts went after their idols, Amos 5.26, it is all to Moloch and Cheon and not to him. Such, I say, is all the worship that men designed to offer to the living God when not according to the gospel. Such was the worship of the Samaritans of old, as our Savior testified, and such is the worship of the Jews and Mohammedans at present. Their pretense of owning one God will not free them from offering their sacred services to Moloch and Chion, images and stars of God which they have framed to themselves. When therefore any depart from the gospel, they depart from the living God, because they have no way left to them in which they may glorify him as God, and he that does not so renounces him. And therefore our apostles, speaking of those heathen, who had those notions of one God which some boast of at this day, and choose to rest in, affirms plainly that they were atheists while they were in the world. Ephesians 2.12 They knew not how to glorify God by any acceptable worship, and is good not to own God at all is not to glorify him as God. For after God in the first precept has required that we should have him for our God and none else, that we may do so and know how to do so, he required in the second, with the same authority, that we worship and glorify him according to his mind and prescription. Thirdly, there is no other way in which we may obtain the least encouraging intimation of the favor or good will of God towards us, no way whereby his grace or his acceptance of us may be firmed and assured to us, but this only, and where there is not a sufficient ground hereof, no man can abide with God in a due manner. If men have not a stable foundation to apprehend God to be good and gracious and willing to receive them, they will no otherwise respect or esteem him, but as the poor Indians do the devil, whom they worship, that he may do them no harm. I do know that men have strange presumptions concerning the goodness and inclinations of God to sinners, and according to them they pretend highly to love God and delight in him without respect to the Lord Christ or the gospel. But it were an easy thing to divest their notions of all those swelling words of vanity in which they dress them, and manifest them to be mere presumptions, inconsistent with the nature of God and all the revelation that he has made of himself. Whatever may be apprehended in God of this nature or to this purpose is either his natural goodness, kindness, benignity, and love, or that which includes all the free acts of his will towards mankind for good. And our apostle affirms that the revelation, declaration, and appearance of both of these is merely from and by the gospel or the grace of God by Jesus Christ, Titus 3, 4-7. to And without this it is impossible that men will abide in their apostasy from God or return to it. And this will discover the great multitude of practical atheists that are in the world. 
Many there are who have been educated in some observance of the gospel, and some who have been brought under great conviction by the word of it, who do yet, by the power of their lusts and temptations in the world, come to renounce and despise all the institutions, ordinances, and worship of the gospel, and consequently the author of it himself. For it is a vain thing to pretend love or honor to Christ, and not to keep his commandments. However, they would not be reckoned among atheists, for they still acknowledge one, or the one God, but they do herein but industriously deceive their own souls. Then they forsake the living God, when they forsake the gospel of his Son. And let us all know what care and reverence becomes us in the things of the gospel. God is in them, even the living God. Otherwise, he will be neither known nor worshipped. His name, his authority, his grace are stamped on them all. When a heart is made evil by unbelief, it is engaged in a course of sinful defection or revolt from the living God. 